Pilon fractures, this is the second part of our two-part video. These are from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5, slides by Dr. Michael Leslie. I'm Saqib Rahman narrating the slides for you, and uh, we already went through the anatomy, the um, x-ray interpretation. We talked about staged versus um, uh, non-staged management, although we talked a lot about, more about staged management. Um, and uh, we're now going to talk about, uh, oh, we talked about preoperative planning, and now we're going to go through surgical approaches. So um, understand your fracture pattern, understand your soft tissue injury, understand the local anatomy. This will help to dictate which surgical approach you're going to use because you may, you may look just at the x-ray and CT scan and say, all right, we have to go in this way, and then you look at the wounds and the soft tissue injury and where the Maybe there were blisters, for example, uh, and um, where there may have been partial vascular injury or whatever there may be, and realize your surgical approach needs to be different, right? So you can't just rely on just a fracture pattern. So the anteromedial approach uh, is one such approach. Uh, you'll come uh, kind of in the direction shown by the blue arrow here, one centimeter lateral to the tibial crest proximally, parallel to the tibial crest. And at the ankle joint, the incision curves to the distal point of the medial malleolus. Um, the anterior compartment fascia is incised beneath, uh, between the tibial crest and the tib ant sheath. So careful not to open up the tendon sheath itself. And uh, if you, you know, because if you have any wound problems and the tendon is right under the incision, you're really going to have a, a problem with wound healing um, and you're going to have a difficult time just getting you know, that, to, that to heal without potentially having to go up the ladder with free, free, free uh, tissue transfer or something like that. Um, the anterior compartment muscles are then retracted laterally, and then this allows you to get onto the medial face of the tibia, or even up over onto the lateral tibia proximally uh, for plate support. Here you can see your tibialis anterior tendon right there. So uh, here's that illustrated. Um, you can see the skin incision paralleling the uh, tibial crest proximally and then curving medially, just anterior to, tib uh, to the medial malleolus, and you are medial to the tibialis anterior. And here you can see, you now you can get exposure of the anterior part of the plafond, of course, more medially. You can get access to the medial distal tibia, um, and you can place, for instance, plate fixation on the anterior tibia as, as shown right here. Uh, you can get fixation on the medial tibia, as shown as well. Um, so this is a great uh, workhorse approach. Um, anterolateral approach is another anterior approach. This is in line with Chaput's tubercle to the mid portion of the fourth metatarsal. The superficial perineal nerve will be in your field and oftentimes branching, so you will have to look for this before you get down to fascia. Once you get that out of the way, you're going to incise the fascia over the anterior compartment, and this time you're going to retract the anterior compartment tissues laterally, right? So you're going to get in here, you're going to retract everything over laterally, and um, uh, and then access the um, the anterior part of the plafond. Um, you potentially can also get to the anterior aspect of the fibula. So let's say. Um, that uh, you have a fibula fracture, you need to treat uh, that, and you really don't want to have, you know, an incision here and another incision here. Well, you can do the anterolateral incision and get to many fibula fractures and fix that through the same incision. So let's look at that here. So here's your anterolateral incision, retracting all the uh, anterior compartment uh, tendons and muscles over medially. So here you're also getting anterior exposure of the plafond like you did with the anteromedial approach, except now you're also getting all the way over to the chaput uh, tubercle and uh, slightly different um, uh, view of the joint. Um, so if you do have uh, um, you know, fractures that require more plate fixation on the lateral side, if you really need more direct exposure of that chaput fragment, or if your soft tissues dictate that you really just can't go anteromedially, then Here's another approach, and you can see how you can also 
uh, get to the fibula um, through this approach. It may be difficult for you to place your fixation directly laterally as shown here. Sometimes you may have to place your um, uh, fixation a little bit more anteriorly on the fibula, but nevertheless, it can get you access to the fibula. Posterolateral approaches. So to really get great posterolateral exposure, you, you probably need to be prone in most surgeons' hands. Uh, the incision is midway between the Achilles tendon, which you can very easily palpate, and the posterior border of the fibula. Um, so you're going to kind of mark halfway, and um, that's your um, sort of skin incision. Uh, the sterile nerve will be in, in the neighborhood, so you can identify that. Uh, you're going to then go between the Achilles and perineals, um, and then the deep interval is between the FHL, which is a very low-lying muscle belly, and the perineals. And there's going to potentially be a little bit of bleeding here. So you're going to control that, and then you're going to elevate the FHL. Like I said, a lot of muscle, low-lying muscle belly down here. So you're not going to just see this cord-like tendon. Um, it's going to be low-lying muscle off of the posterior tibia. And... Um, that's going to get you, so you're going to, you know, and then you're going to retract that in this direction, and then you're going to get onto this posterolateral fragment. So here's the approach, um, midway between the fibula and the Achilles tendon, um, and then uh, once retracting um, the super, more superficial structures, you're going to move the, um, the uh, FHL, as shown here, um, over, and uh, you're going to get to that... Um, to put fragment. Now you can also get to the posterior fibula as shown here. So this is also a way you can fix the fibula through the same, uh, same incision. Posterior medial approach is another approach. And again, this could be dictated by your fracture pattern or um, your soft tissue injuries. This is between the Achilles tendon and the posterior medial border of the tibia. And you're going to open the flexor retinaculum and you're going to go between the posterior tibial tendon, flexor digitorum communis, and flexor hallucis longus, and the neurovascular bundle between the uh, FDC and the FHL. So here you can see posterior medial approach um, and how you will retract the uh, bundle over and then the uh, um, muscles in the opposite direction. And this is going to get you to other type of posterior malleolar fractures. Um, it could be an extended Volkmann fragment that comes all the way across. You can sometimes have um, a, a sort of a different pattern than I had shown in the previous um, video of your sort of standard uh, three fragments of the, of the plafond. There are variations and sometimes going posterior lateral just doesn't make the most sense. So this can give you a nice exposure posterior medial if that's where you need to get. Many patients will need a minimum of two incisions, uh, and if you need maybe more than two, um, but you do have to be careful um, because you know multiple incisions you do put the the skin flaps at risk for breakdown. Classically, a seven centimeter bridge um, has been uh, advocated to prevent skin necrosis, although this has been uh, somewhat challenged in some case series. Um, Nevertheless, meticulous soft tissue handling and appropriate surgical timing, which is important with all surgery, um, is uh, its importance is magnified uh, when handling pilon fractures. It's good to understand angiosomes, and I think a lot of uh, orthopedic surgeons really don't take the time to understand this. Yet, um, when it comes to treating these cases, uh, this can be really powerful information. So. An angiosome is a 3D anatomic unit describing the skin and muscle supplied by a source artery. And you really have to think about this when selecting combined surgical approaches. Uh, choke vessels, so-called choke vessels between angiosomes, provide blood flow to adjacent angiosomes if those source arteries are damaged. And occasionally you will have a patient with a perineal artery injury that's not doesn't need vascular repair, but it's going to compromise your skin flaps. So these require some time before they become widely patent. So here's the posterior tibial artery angiosome, more or less. Okay, and it's the anterior border of the tibia to the midline of the gastroc posteriorly. Uh, and uh, the posterior medial, I'm sorry, the posterior medial malleolar artery and uh, uh, plantar foot. It's shown here. The 
anterior tibial artery, um, as you would expect, provides um, blood supply to this angiosome, as shown in the clinical image here. And you can now sort of correlate these with some of the surgical approaches you may have to do. And then the perineal artery, we're looking at the lateral side of the foot. It's fairly wide territory um, that it provides uh, blood supply to. So fixation considerations. Um, you really don't want to go overboard. You want to do the minimum fixation for maximal stability. Um, buttress can be more powerful than poorly located locked fixation contra construct. So um, be thoughtful for you know those initial images and where you need to place your fixation to provide to provide buttressing, as we talked about in the last video. Uh, you can use percutaneous screw insertions um, if it's simple enough to do and. Um, instead of having to open another, in, you know, long incision or um, mobilize your flap, um, and just keep in mind, there's so many pre-contoured plates now. It's not always better. Sometimes they're just not effectively contoured for what you need to do. So, mini fragment plates that are contoured by the surgeon sometimes can be helpful um, for certain fracture patterns, uh, or at least as adjunctive fixation. Um, instead of having to use a pre-contoured plate for everything. Uh, locked fixation indications are when you have small articular blocks that are already reconstructed, uh, metaphyseal comminution, osteoporotic patients, classic indication for locked plates. What about intramedullary fibula fixation? I hinted at this in the um, previous video. Um, this can... Um, really be helpful when you have relatively simple patterns uh, that are length stable. Um, and if you think about it, everything we talked about with compromise, you know, fibular incision compromising your approach or, you know, the, the um, malreductions uh, that can sometimes occur uh, with early plate fixation, a lot of issues can be potentially addressed with intramedullary fixation. Now, this can be challenging if you have a very comminuted fracture with potential for a lot of shortening, but this can help to provide varus valgus support. It can provide a lot of stability, especially if you have a length stable fracture, and avoid having to make a pretty large uh, open incision in a patient with soft tissue compromise um, and provide reasonable stability. So there's an example shown here of a long 3.5 millimeter cortical screw that can act as um, a nice way to fix um, to fix a certain fibula fracture pattern. What about intramedullary nailing of the tibia? Well, these can be helpful in certain fracture patterns. It can improve early stability for healing of long regions of comminution. So here you can see a fracture going way up into the tibial shaft. This is a plafond fracture, but also a shaft fracture. Um, so you can see how um, this can provide significant stability for your shaft component and sometimes you know, can be used in conjunction with um, your articular reconstruction. Now, unfortunately, you may have frag fractures that are somewhat unreconstructable or you determine them to be unreconstructable. Here's an example, 56-year-old female, polytrauma, open pilon, Talus, calcaneus, multiple other injuries, and a delayed presentation. You know, the wounds would require free flaps um, if you're going to use them for stage fixation. So, XFX is done, uh, pr uh, provisional uh, K wire stabilization, primary closure, and, uh, you know, the patient recovers from the trauma. And, uh, you know, this was a pretty bad articular injury at multiple levels in the hind foot and ankle. So, this patient, um, you know, your goals are a little bit more limited. Um, you're considering that this is not someone you're going to be able to restore excellent motion to. There's high risks for complications. Most likely going to have a very stiff ankle and potentially painful. So um, in this case, there is no attempt at articular reconstruction. And in fact, a retrograde uh, tibial or calcaneal nail is done. Here's another example, unreconstructable. Why? Well, there is significant lack of articular surface. You can see there's beads, stage management, external fixation, presumably an open fracture. And this case is also treated with primary arthrodesis. So 
can be controversial in some cases, but um, we are starting to learn which patients, you know, patients with bad diabetes, patients with, uh, you know, we talked about in the, one of the very first slides in the last video, um, neuropathic patients, um, patients who have significant risk factors for infection and very challenging fracture patterns, you may have to think about arthrodesis as an option. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, but that's a little bit more of an advanced topic. Postoperative care, well-padded splint, ice elevation, analgesia, hopefully early motion in two to three weeks. A lot of times you're not pushing early motion immediately. Um, you're generally more worried about the soft tissue envelope here than you are with like a hip or even a knee. Um, and uh, you will oftentimes be uh, leaning towards favoring soft tissue healing and wound flap healing and avoiding problems there before you start moving them. I think that's something a lot of surgeons will will follow. A DVT prophylaxis um, should be provided based on their comorbidities and other trauma considerations. Uh, and if you're applying AO technique, part of that is early mobilization. So you do want to get them mobilized at least. Um, swelling control, um, preventing contractures, and most of the time non-weight bearing, eight to 12 weeks, like with most lower extremity articular fractures, physical therapy, and you do have to watch for complications. We've kind of talked about that a lot. Well, wound breakdown can happen, infection, malunion, non-union, and uh, malunion is most common when you have an intact fibula leading to varus malunion, um, Malunion of the joint, unfortunately, can occur, um, and uh, sometimes if you don't understand your fracture pattern or can't see well, this, this can occur. So intraoperative CT scans can sometimes help. Um, malunion and nonunion of the metaphysis is fairly common, too, and this is why if you have voids, you may want to consider bone grafting at the time of surgery. Here's a case of non-union, 69-year-old female, fractured pilon three weeks after a contralateral total knee replacement. So that's a real bummer. Patient's treated with primary ORIF. It's a low-energy injury. There's mild swelling. So this was felt to be appropriate. Unfortunately, fracture does not heal, and there's plate fatigue at three months. You can see crack in the plate right here. And uh, this patient is treated with removal of hardware, intramedullary nailing, uh, bone grafting, and um, you can see those go on to union, fortunately. Now, patients will unfortunately get stiff very commonly with these injuries. Uh, they can have declining function over time, uh, and you can get um, post-traumatic arthritis, with, especially with higher energy injuries. Um, Pollock et al. reported on AD pilon fracture patients at 3.2 years, and they had lower SF36 scores and physical function uh, and health than the population. Uh, low income and lower educational level patients were more likely to have poor clinical outcomes, so that's something beyond your control. Uh, and two or more comorbidities, uh, medical comorbidities, had poor outcomes. Patients uh, with uh, XFIX treatment were more likely to have limited range of motion, more pain, more ambulatory dysfunction. So these patients definitively treated with um, XFIX. So we haven't really talked about that a lot, but pilon fractures are somewhat life-changing injuries. I think out of a lot of the fractures that we treat, these are the ones that really can have... Um, you know, especially for somebody who's normally on their feet a lot, maybe a laborer who needs to be on their feet, carrying heavy loads, maybe up on a roof or something. This can really, they may not be able to go back to doing that. Uh, someone who's used to running may not get back to running. Um, and these are tough conversations you have to have with your patients. These are uh, tough cases surgically. They're challenging reconstructions. Um, Keep in mind, staged approaches are uh, common. Um, this is not necessarily a rule. There are centers that are able to um, and have reported on successful uh, outcomes without doing staged management uh, in a majority of cases, but I think a lot of places are doing staged management, um, especially in high-energy fractures. Think about all the surgical approaches needed and how your soft tissue compromise uh, may dictate that in addition to the fracture pattern. 
And just remember, um, arthrodesis is an option uh, in, in certain cases, and it may not necessarily mean, need to be done immediately. These are acknowledgments uh, Dr. Leslie put in the slides. And that concludes our lecture on pilon fractures from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series version 5. Thanks.